Hey everybody, this is Matt Atkinson, and you're watching Four Gettysburg with Aaron Smith. What's going on everybody? Aaron Smith here for Forward Gettysburg. Thank you guys so, so much for joining me for this episode. Today, we are talking about the most controversial order of the American Civil War. I am on East Cemetery Hill. It's a beautiful, chilly day here in Gettysburg. Again, thank you guys so, so much for joining me. If you are enjoying the channel, if you are enjoying the videos, please remember to like and subscribe to the channel. Situation July 1st in the afternoon, the Confederates have smashed and sent the Union lines north and west of town. They have sent them running back through the towns, then the streets and, and the lanes of Gettysburg. The Union, they are going to fall back and they're going to reform and rally on Cemetery Hill here. Now, some sources claim that John Reynolds eyed Cemetery Hill as the key position here at Gettysburg. However, it's going to be Oliver Otis Howard, commander of the Union 11th Corps, who is going to leave behind a division under Adolf von Steinwehr here. And he's going to leave that behind with the intention of a rallying point in case things went bad in their original positions north and west of town. And so after hours of sustained fighting to the north and to the west, the Union, they're going to start to fall back through the narrow streets and lanes of Gettysburg. They're going to fall back here to Cemetery Hill. Now the Union forces, however, they had failed to be totally crushed. Robert E. Lee wanted to absolutely destroy the Union core by core. One of his messages that he sent out is going to detail just that. He wants to, he wants to fall upon them and destroy them core by core, but Robert E. Lee has failed to do that. And so with the Union rallying on Cemetery Hill, and reinforcements trickling in. We have Stannard's huge Vermonter Brigade. You know, all these reinforcements starting to trickle in and the 12th Corps now on its way. Robert E. Lee is no longer faced with the relatively simple task of pursuing and, and following up. He now has to prepare for an entirely new assault. Now, Robert E. Lee realized he had to make the effort to take Cemetery Hill. He had to make the effort to drive the Union Army from Gettysburg. But his resources were very, very slim. He was still missing five infantry divisions of the Army of Northern Virginia. So he is going to send probably, no, undoubtedly the most controversial order to Richard Stoddart Yule, his commander of his 2nd Corps, and that order is going to tell Yule to take that hill if practicable. Now what in the world does practicable mean? That's not a word we hear very often in our modern day language. So the Oxford Dictionary describes practicable as able to be done or put into practice successfully. Able to be done or put into practice successfully. That is going to leave Yule with a huge amount of discretion in how he is going to fulfill this order of taking this hill, if it is practicable or not. Now, at the time, all the, all the infantry divisions for the South had seen very, very heavy fighting. You had fighting going on at Blocker's Knoll, north of town. You had the intense fighting in the McPherson's Woods and along the Chambersburg Pike, the railroad cut, all these places. The first day wasn't just this little cavalry engagement like the movie's going to make it out to be. No, the first day was an incredibly bloody and costly affair for both sides. However, there was one division that was relatively fresh, and that was the division of Richard Anderson, a South Carolinian man. And Richard Anderson's division is headed towards Gettysburg on July 1st, and they're going to reach there about the middle of the afternoon. However, they're going to be asked to halt. A messenger from Robert E. Lee is going to come to Richard Anderson and order his division to halt. And Anderson is going to be really confused by that. Anderson knows there's fighting going on. No doubt he can hear the echo and roar of cannon in the distance just a few miles off. 
So Anderson himself is going to confer with Lee to make sure that he heard this order right, that maybe something wasn't lost in translation or the messenger gave him the wrong order or so on and so forth. But Lee is going to confirm with Anderson, yes, I ordered you to halt. You are my only fresh division. You are going to be my reserve. So with Anderson tucked back in the back of our mind, let's get back to the main question here. Is taking Cemetery Hill practicable. Did Yule think taking this area was practicable at the time, at the time those orders were issued to him? First, to answer that, we need to look at the town of Gettysburg itself. The Confederates, as soon as those Union men retreat back through town, the Confederates are going to lose all momentum of their attack, probably for a few different reasons. They're now engaged in the narrow streets and lanes of a town that they are unfamiliar with. On top of that, they would face some intense marching and some even more intense fighting that day on July 1st. So by this point in the afternoon, when the Union finally falls back through town, they are going to be exhausted. They are going to run into the narrow streets and lanes of the town of Gettysburg. And even though it's just as confusing for the Union who's retreating, the Confederates, they're going to lose all momentum because it's going to be confusing for them as well. Second, as they come through town, they're going to face heavy skirmish fire from the Union. They're going to be posted up in buildings all over town. The Confederates will eventually do the same as well. But we're talking about some of the very first urban warfare type of tactics that are going to be seen here on the American continent. So these men are going to be going through town. They're going to be facing skirmishing fire. So they're going to try to find cover. Not only that, they're now fighting with the narrow lanes in the streets. They have no idea what Washington Street is, Stratton Street, uh, Carlisle Street. They, they don't know how to navigate their way through this town. They've never been in it before. So they're going to be confused. They're going to lose unit cohesion. They're going to become very disorganized as they try to pursue through the town of Gettysburg. Thirdly, the rebels had just been engaged in some incredibly heavy fighting. These men are tired. These men are exhausted. There is a lack of water. You know, the, the, the spirit is certainly there. The spirit is willing, but I'm sure the flesh is weak, as they say. These men are absolutely doggone tired from this fighting. And when men in the Civil War or men in any kind of fighting force from any period of history, when they get tired, when they're exhausted, they're not going to be as effective fighters if they're fresh out of camp and maybe walked a mile or two. And the last reason, the South had captured thousands of Union prisoners on day one. And in order to keep track and watch these prisoners, they're going to have to detach men to guard over the men who were captured. Their manpower is going to be depleted from that as well when you add in all the casualties that they had taken that day so far. Now, all of these factors that I just described, they're going to go into Yule's decision making. Is it practicable to take Cemetery Hill? And it's going to frustrate Yule. Yule is going to be frustrated with the prospect of a new assault with exhausted men. At the time, he might have been able to scrounge up six or 7,000 men to make this assault. And you, he considers sending off for the third corps, for elements from the third corps. We have Anderson that is fresh. They have not seen any fighting, but that is Lee's reserve. And Lee gave the order to Yule. So Yule really, really feels that this is on him to make this assault. Now, as all these things are going through Yule's mind, as he's weighing all these options, he is going to receive a report of Union forces moving on his left flank along the York Pike. So he's going to detach Gordon's Brigade of Georgians. They're going to mix, they're going to meet up with extra Billy Smith's Brigade, which is already out on the York Pike. And they're going to reconnoiter and look out for Union troops coming along that York Pike. Now, however, the 12th Corps, elements of the 12th Corps, uh, specifically Williams Division, they're making their way um, somewhere in the area of the Hanover Road toward Benners Hill. And this is where the reports kind of get confusing. You have Jenkins Independent Cavalry Command who is attached to Yule's 2nd Corps. No doubt Jenkins sees Williams Division or perhaps elements of Williams Division moving down that road, but Jenkins Cavalry is not 
as well versed in reconnaissance and they're in unfamiliar territory. So these men for a large chunk of that late afternoon, early evening, they're going to be looking down the wrong road. So as the moments go by, as they're doing this reconnaissance, looking out on the York Pike, uh, all these things are going on, Yule's weighing his options. As the minutes tick on, Cemetery Hill becomes an even more formidable position. Reinforcements are trickling in by the minute. And soon we have the 12th Corps' arrival under Henry Slocum. Around five or six in the evening, Slocum's 12th Corps is going to reach the battlefield in force. And now this area is going to have around 27,000 men of the Army of the Potomac on it. Not only that, but there are going to be 85 guns posted in this area, East Cemetery Hill, Cemetery Hill, and even some elements on Culp's Hill. The First Corps, Wadsworth's division, is going to be posted over there on Culp's Hill. So this area is going to have 85 guns in it, 27,000 men. The Union are not wasting any time in making this an impregnable position. And, and as this goes on, as Yule is spending time reconnoitering what's going on to the east, his chances of a successful attack, the timeliness, the effectiveness of this attack slowly slips away from him. Yule's investigation of the York Pike comes back unfounded. There's nothing really happening on the York Pike at this time. But by this time, dusk is fast approaching. And now he is faced with the idea of a night attack. A night attack being a, a near suicidal in the Civil War. So faced with a proposal of a night attack or just kind of chilling out and seeing what the morning brings, Yule is going to choose the latter of those choices. Though if we looked at the combined forces of both armies at the end of day one, the Confederates still outnumber the Union. The Union holds this high ground. Yule, his, his options are attack Really, his only option is attack through town. They're going to have to face skirmishing fire. They're going to have to face a terrible, terrible bombardment from 85 guns posted in this area. Uh, that's just an incredible amount of cannon and, and rifle guns that are going to be bearing down upon the Confederates. Not only that, but the Union is not wasting any time reinforcing this area with very crude breastworks, rail fences. There are stone fences in this area. So, so this has become a really really dreadful proposition that Yule has and Yule eventually is going to determine that it is not practicable to take this hill. So now we reach a natural question for anybody that studies this part of the battle. Who is at fault for not taking Cemetery Hill? Yule or Lee? So Robert E. Lee he was used to giving very vague orders to his subordinates, to his lieutenants. He would say, do this. And then especially Stonewall Jackson, probably the finest military mind that the Civil War produced, he would determine all the minutia. He would determine all the tactics, the strategy behind this order, and he would make it happen. Lee was used to giving orders to Stonewall Jackson, to the likes of Stonewall Jackson, letting Jackson, you know, iron out the details. Yule was fresh to Corps command. Lee gave Yule a very, very vague order. Take that hill if practicable. Not only that, but Lee wasn't willing to go all out in this aggressive action. Lee didn't know what the size of the Union Army in this area was. He had no idea if it was just the 1st and the 11th Corps that he had faced that day, or if the entire Army of the Potomac was waiting in this area, luring him in. So Robert E. Lee, he's not willing to go all out. He's not willing to put all of his fresh divisions. He's not willing to put Anderson's division into the attack. He's not willing to commit soldiers from the 3rd Corps under A.P. Hill, where Robert E. Lee is attached to currently during the battle. He's not willing to put forth all of those soldiers. And there were still some relatively fresh brigades, Lane's Brigade, Scales Brigade, Perrin's Brigade. All those brigades, they had seen lighter action compared to the likes of the brigades in Heath's division or Early's division or, or Rhodes' division. So they had seen lighter action. So he still had troops that he could send forward into this fight to take Cemetery Hill, but he wasn't willing to bolster 
Yule's second core. He put this entirely on Yule to succeed. He put this entirely on Yule to make happen and Yule is just not able to make it happen. As the early afternoon hours wane on into the evening, the likelihood of, of a successful assault on Cemetery Hill slip away minute by minute. And by dusk, the Union Army has turned Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill, East Cemetery Hill, and parts of Cemetery Ridge into a verifiable fortress. They have turned it into an incredibly tough position to assault. Cemetery Hill being the key to that position. Cemetery Hill directly behind me runs the Baltimore Pike. The Baltimore Pike being the Army of the Potomac's main supply line to Westminster, Maryland. Not only that, it is a road that goes directly to Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. And even further, the main route of retreat for George Gordon Meade in case he is crushed here at Gettysburg and needs to fall back to fulfill the order given to him by Henry Halleck and Abraham Lincoln to cover the roads and defend Washington and Baltimore. The battle likely could have been won for the South if Robert E. Lee was willing to give the proper support to Richard Stoddart Ewell and the Second Corps to take this hill. However, he does not. So whose fault is it that Cemetery Hill isn't captured? Part Yule, part Lee. I, I buy into about half and half. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Forward Gettysburg. I absolutely love talking about the first day. I love getting into the weeds, especially about the orders given by Lee to Yule and talking about could they have captured Cemetery Hill? Could they have not captured Cemetery Hill? Either way, Thank you guys so, so much for joining me. As always, this is Forward Gettysburg. I'm your host, Aaron Smith, and I'll catch you on the next one.